Testing, one, two, three. Hello, I'm Mahesh Saptarishi, the host of Mic Drop, a podcast where we explore what makes innovators tick. There is no template that guarantees innovation, yet there are some patterns. Without tenacity, you will likely give up too soon. Without being inspired and without the ability to inspire others, you won't have the strength of a community. Without being creative, you'll not be able to break from the status quo. Without being knowledgeable, you'll not be able to identify consequential problems. Innovators, almost without exception, are tenacious, inspiring, creative, and knowledgeable. This is what makes innovators tick, leading to that mic drop moment. The purpose of this podcast is to learn and make that mic drop moment more likely for the each of us. Thank you and enjoy. By the way, in all of this, after video IQ going into a vigilon, I no longer had a futon in my office to sleep on, which, which I consider to be a victory. Very happy to have Serge Parisi, VP of Engineering for the Video Security and Access Control business, joining me today. I've known Serge for over 15 years at this point, which, thinking about it, seems like a really long time. And when I think back and sort of sort out or list out some of the products and capabilities that I'm most proud of over the past uh, 15 years, Serge has been part of it. We were together as a team executing on a lot of those capabilities. And so I've learned a lot from Serge. I think all of you will learn a lot from him as well. So we're going to get right into this conversation. Serge, welcome. Hey, thanks, Mahesh. It's great to see you again. And I can't believe it's been 15 years. And yeah, we've, we've had quite the journey and we've developed some great products with some great teams for sure. Absolutely. So we're going to try to rewind well before Video IQ, well before those 15 years and get a glimpse of you even before I think you were infected by the Mahesh bug. In some way, um, and, and believe me, I was affected from the minute I met you because I said, "Yeah, I definitely want to work with this guy." So maybe kind of going back to at least your technical beginnings, what what got you interested in engineering? I was always that kid that liked to take things apart. I'd like to understand how things worked. So it was really never a choice for me. It's like I love math, I love physics, I love science. So I said, "Yeah." Engineering sounds perfect for me. So after college, you're looking for your first role. What was your first role? The first role was in, as an engineer, hardware engineer, hardware development engineer for a company called Bendix. They did some military work. So I got to my role and it's when microprocessors first came out, right? And so at the time, I was the only person in the company that actually programmed the microprocessor. And so my first role was, okay, what do we do with these microprocessor things? And I created a first microprocessor product for that company. And I did all the code for it, and I loved it. I did it all in assembly language, Mesh, but it was a heck of a lot of fun. I didn't know what I was doing, but at the end of the day, we, we did this really cool setup for simulating harpoon missiles. From there, I became their rock star because everybody wanted to work on microprocessors all of a sudden. So it was quite fun. They, they put me in an R&D group, and we just got to play with lots of different technologies. And I stayed there for 15 years because I was able to work on many different technologies. And by the time I left, I was working on 3D graphics simulators, which at the time, we were trying to use ray tracing in real time. It was fantastic. It was just fun. But I really got the bug to to go more into commercial electronics, more serious, fun things, and not serious things, more fun things, I would say. And was, was DEC after uh, mm -hmm. this company? Yeah, so I looked for companies that made consumer-type electronics. Digital equipment just cratered, but they had this really great team that was working on laptop computers at the time. A really fantastic team. It was like a Skunk Works team. And I came up here to Boston and did the interview and, and got the position. The first product I worked on was they wanted to do this 14-inch laptop, which at the time 
didn't exist. We did it and they unveiled it at the NBA finals. And that's when I wanted to show my son that I could do something cool. Check that out. <laughs> so we're watching the finals. I didn't tell him it was going to happen. And he saw the, the prototypes that I know had at home unveiled at the NBA finals. So I thought that was cool. And you mentioned this is sort of a Skunk Works team initially that you were part of. And I assume that it sort of expanded from that to, to something that was a bigger program within DEC. Not really. So we got acquired by Compaq. Yeah. And then when we got acquired by Compaq, Compaq asked me to be the director of engineering for their handheld team. The laptop team kind of was just another team making laptops for Compaq. And so Compaq had this idea of, of doing those portable handheld devices before iPhone. And this was in the 90s. And I took that as being an, an unbelievable challenge to, to, to do that. And again, it really got me to, to work on some fun technologies there as well. So after DEC, you, you went to Eucentric. Yeah. And so yeah. What, what caused you to jump from large company to tiny startup? Really what I always wanted to do, even in my time at Compaq, like I said, we, we were a small team that just went after making a product. And that always really excites me, being focused, working your ass off to get that, or I'm probably not supposed to say that, working hard to get that product out there. And so I started looking around for startups and I came across Eucentric. And it was a time where there was lots of money available for startups, 1999, right before they cratered. And I found this team and, and what they were doing was their aspiration was to be your main system to have all your pictures, all your media, all your music, all located in one place and distributed throughout the house. I love the idea. It's like, you got digital pictures now. You got all this video. You've got the start of DVR. And so like, take that, put it all in one place and use existing home wiring, use wireless, whatever it takes to get to the various rooms within your house and consume that media. What were you doing when you first joined Eucentric? Because I think there's a story there in terms of how you had to take <laughs> over the majority of the team. So they hired me as director of hardware. And so I put together a hardware team for them. I was really their first hardware hire. I hired some of the guys that I worked with at Compaq as well. And <laughs> we made some great hardware. And the issue was that on the software side, we had a really incredibly smart team. Just really smart but they didn't like each other at all. <laughs> so, and so I just remember my boss coming into me and saying, hey, look, man, the way you're running your hardware team, why don't you run the software team too? I'm like, I'm not sure I want to deal with those guys. I mean, literally there was fights in the hallways. And so, yeah, I wound up running the software team as well. And like I said, I respect those guys because brilliant guys. And it was about really trying to help them understand that if if we all don't win, none of us win. You can you can be the best best developer, the best creative person on the team, but if the team doesn't win, the company goes down. And and when you talk about startups, that's one thing that message comes out really clear, right? It's like you're focused on delivering the best product you can deliver. And if you fail, the company fails. So yeah, it, it was a really good learning experience to me and, and I, I was really excited about the product as well. This one seems like it's not just the fact that you took over a team, but there were a lot of things that you needed to actually go fix to make that team function and for it to really be a team. And so as you tried to get them to think as one with one goal and align them, what are the things that you kind of had to do that worked and what are the things that in retrospect you did that perhaps worked less effectively? So one of the things that worked was really getting the whole team and really getting them in a room and laying out what we want to get accomplished and then think about how we want to accomplish it. And being part of the team from the beginning, though, I knew who were the strongest people there from a technical perspective. So I always mm -hmm. try to rely on those kinds of people to say, where should we take this architecture? What makes the most sense? 
and then do that in the back room and then bring that to the team and help them understand that this is really the, the way we want to go. It took time to do that, but once we started setting that direction and getting people on the same page, it started working. The thing I would have done differently is I may have let some people go earlier than I did. I let them leave on their own accord where maybe I should have forced their hand a bit mm-hmm. because there were people that were never going to get on the train. Yeah. And, and maybe I could have done a better job at, at looking at that. And you know what? When they leave, generally they're happier, right? Because they'll find a better slot for them if, they, if they're not in the same flow. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things where assembling a group of the smartest people doesn't necessarily make for a successful team in many ways. And the hardest part is if you know that somebody's incredibly smart, but you have to let them go anyway, that yeah, stinks. For sure. <laughs> but it's the right thing to do for the team. Yeah. So So what year did you get acquired by Motorola? Well, you're putting me to the test right now. Somewhere around 2005. Yeah, 2005. And so now you're part of, you went from a startup to a large company, the larger version of Motorola than we know of today. How was that? So it was good initially. I would say that the company, it was headquartered, the, the set-top box group was headquartered in Horsham, Pennsylvania. They really believed in what we were doing and they wanted us to grow and grow quickly. They loved our software, loved our capabilities, loved our team. And so they put, in us, put us in these nice plush offices in Lexington. So that was cool. And so, yeah, we, we started working with that team and they were ultra supportive. And so we were working on taking our software and putting it on their, their set-top boxes. Very cool. And then in 2007, you joined Video IQ. And- I did. I was, again, once again, itching to go work for a startup again. And so I started floating my resume out there. And then I ran into you, man. And yeah, I saw, I saw people with boxes around them, Mahesh. In real time, and I'm like, oh wow, this is very cool, and this is this is definitely the future. So, and you came in at about the right time when I think a month after we raised our Series A funding. I think that's about right. And this was sort of the Mahesh version of running an engineering company, which was controlled chaos, and there was a lot of discipline, a lot of structure that was required. And and you came in and kind of structured the team. It was. It was fascinating watching you implement true Agile versus sort of the graduate student version of Agile development. Yeah, it was a really fun time. I mean, I remember coming in and you had a bed set up, I think, in in that (laughs) office. (laughs) And you had these dark circles under your eyes. And I'm like, man, we got to make life easier for this guy because he's the brains of the operation. Okay, let's figure this out. And so, yeah, I mean, I think we did. We did want to implement Agile, and I can't believe how much pushback we had from some members of the team. On oh, I know. That. And again, I think I should have been quicker on releasing some of those people. I think there was two big things. One is some some of the old folks, some of the people that have been there for a while, weren't really into Agile and talking about things every day. And secondly, it was the hardest thing I had was getting people off the old product because they liked it. That was a, a tough transition. And, and like I kept saying, I don't care what you're doing on the old product. I don't care because you had a great vision. You want to put it on a camera, put it on the edge. And uh, we had a lot of work in front of us to do that. I think to maybe give everybody a little more context, we were taking video analytics, which at that point in time ran on servers connected to fairly dumb cameras, and we were building a camera that effectively ran the analytics right on board. But in addition to that, we built a full storage system on the camera. And I think part of that was also keeping the team like motivated and like sort of really trying to empower, inspiring them to go do this, which by the way, they they had families, folks had families, they were spending time doing this. Like what were the things that I think you had to pay attention to, to to make some of that happen? In startups, it's quite great in that you have, in general, a single product and a single product focus. So the team gets it. So motivating the team 
is is pretty straightforward. Here's our vision. And Mahesh, of everybody, you're the best at showing what that vision is, man. And so once you you get people bought into that vision, it's like now you've got to tell them, okay, you can go home now because in a lot of cases, developers just want to, okay, I got this. I'm going to make this work tonight. And so we had a lot of instances. I mean, I, I remember walking in and Kevin Piet was still wearing the same thing from the night before, still cracking at it. But from a, once you have a vision and you have people bought into that vision, I think that really is a great way to motivate people. Do you have big ideas, but never enough time to see them through? How about all those little tasks that you keep meaning to get to, but are just piling up? Does it feel like you need an innovation vacation? Well, worry no more. I have the solution for you. It's time. 10% time, that is. With 10% time, you can finally tackle that passion project, learn a new skill, collaborate with colleagues. The possibilities are endless. Make focus time a priority by dedicating one out of every 10 days to stretching that beautiful brain of yours. Talk to your manager about it today. Finding time for innovation just got a whole lot easier. And I think that eventually we became the number one video analytics embedded device provider and got the attention of a few folks at that point, and eventually Vigilon ended up winning the process and, and, and buying us. And then we became part of a Vigilon, and that was like a whole different experience. And, and in some ways, and, and interested in what you have to say about this, but it felt like getting bought by a startup. Exactly. Exactly right. I, I would say that when we were talking about what's the proudest things that I worked on, and one of the things I'm really proud about is the fact that we put a product out into the market nine months after we were acquired by a Vigilon, a joint a Vigilon video IQ product in nine months. And why is that? It's because you're right. We were bought by another startup and our culture was very much the same. And that was the H3A. And then we launched the H4A, I believe, just about... Two years after acquisition, that's when the H4A yeah, uh, came out. Right and at that point, it was not one or two models. It was the entire range of Avigilon's cameras that had analytics in it. Yeah. So I think after the first one, the H3A, we said, okay, we can do anything now. Let's go, <laughs> go after it, go after it hard. I don't know if you remember, Mahesh. I mean, you brought the idea of appearance search to that team with the H4A. Yes. And I think the, the, the other thing that we didn't talk about it that much back then, but in retrospect, it's, it's one of the things that, again, very proud of this. It was our first deep learning solution, right? And it was the very first deep learning solution in the market at that point in time. We didn't really tout it as, as that. We just called it sort of appearance search, but it was our first foray into deep neural networks. And then I think probably the, the next big thing that I would say required that level of effort was Val5. Mm -hmm. That was taking deep learning neural networks and putting it in the camera. Yeah, it was the same exact challenge. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff we did not know about it. And our goal was we want to be better than where, where we are today. We're, we're number one in the industry, but we know we can be better. And, and that was the motivating factor there. So now getting to the, the Val 5 exercise, I think one of the things that you started there with also these regular checkpoint meetings across the, was sort of cross-functional in nature. And some of those were very contentious meetings where we would talk about what, what the performance threshold was that we needed to hit, uh, how to go triage something. Part of that was like a decision framework that I think you were trying to set up where we didn't have teams kind of stalling out in pockets and really surfacing issues early and often and doing it in a, in a more a broader collective setting. Whenever you have so new algorithms, new firmware, new hardware, all of that, 
it becomes difficult, right? I mean, what you want to avoid at all costs is you want to avoid people pointing fingers at each other. And so what those cross-functional meetings were all about was, here's a problem. And what I try to find is, I want a team of people looking at it and solving it. I don't really care whose fault it is. I, I don't care. And that's the attitude we want to bring. It's like, somebody made a mistake somewhere. That's okay. <laughs> but as long as we have the right people looking at it and working on it as a team, that we'll get to the solution. Val 5 had all kinds of challenges because the promise was, okay, it was going to be perfect. It's a CNN. But nothing's ever perfect right out of the gate. And so you and I were in some contentious meetings with the team saying, hey, you know what? I see this little error here, this little error here. But with our experience in analytics, like it's not going to be perfect, guys. But what we wanted to do, show me some threshold numbers that shows us that we're better than where we were before. That's really the threshold that we had. Once we're better, I know we're going to get better because what we released about five, I don't know how many years ago, three years ago, we are a hell of a lot better today. But we had to show that to the industry, to our customers, that we were better than what they had previously. And that was that was a way to set a, a metric there. So Val 5, we got it all done. And then this is also, I think, by the way, in all of this, after Video IQ going into a Vigilon, I no longer had a futon in my office to sleep on, which I consider to be a victory. Well, and- I, th- I thought it was a victory too that you weren't spending every night there. So <laughs> 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 after I started, but... <laughs> So then Motorola acquired us. Like, I think initially it was pretty much business as usual. And we just got the support necessary to, to grow. And probably the, the, the biggest sort of inflection points to, to business as usual was the set of acquisitions we made post a Vigilon. And so you were at the, the heart of it. And now, rather than being the acquired party, you are the acquiring party. And what, what, what were the big changes there? So the, being the acquiring party, one thing when we got acquired by Motorola, what they saw was they saw a business model that worked. They saw a development team that made great products. And so initially, they just wanted us to grow faster, pour, pour gas on that fire, right? They built trust in us. We built trust in them. And it was a really successful model. When I, I looked at the acquisitions that we made, I looked at that as further extensions of our team, right? So it's it's bringing more people in to help us really accelerate what we're trying to do. So going from the days where you were working for a defense-oriented company to to DEC to to Compaq to Ucentric, Video IQ, Vigilon, now Motorola, what are the big sort of people development-centric things that you feel are essential to build good teams? It's all about having the right people, making sure that it's like we talked about, right? It's hard to get rid of a really smart person, right? But making sure that their technical abilities are as important as their sense of team as well, that they want the team to succeed. I think that's from a technical perspective, I used to have a category that I would put people in that were people that were just not good team members, but incredibly smart. And that's a killer for you. So finding that person that has great technical abilities is smart, but wants to do so within a team is huge. And unleashing that person so that he or she doesn't have to deal with a lot of politics doesn't have to deal with a lot of paperwork and is able to do their job sufficiently and they're excited about what they're doing. Those are the keys to, to good technical teams, there's no doubt. If you could give your younger self some sort of pithy advice that would make the older self have an easier professional life, what would it be? Let go more. When I was first becoming a manager and then I became director of engineering, I'd still be rolling up my sleeves. I'd be in the lab and I had really smart people working on this stuff. And so I I think let go more of the technical stuff and spend more time on the people and team stuff, I think would be the advice that I would give. And and don't take things so personally. If something didn't work, like I 
I'd be like you and stay up all night and make sure that it did work, right? Yeah, so don't take things so personal and let go more. So as you kind of pass the torch to some of the folks who are now part of, who report to you, part of your team, what are the top few pieces of advice you'd want to give them? So first of all, I want to say that I'm really proud of the, the people on my team, and I've been taking quite a big step back since I, I announced my retirement to let them take the step up, and they're not going to skip a beat. I've been working with them and talking to them about some of the things I like and don't like, and so, I mean, it's hard to, to say on a broad brush what I would do, but I, I mean, I think as we discussed, remember, it's all about the people. It's all about making sure that we are motivating them, that we give them great things to work on, that we bring out the innovation and to mentor guys below you to make sure that once you step away, that we, that we don't skip a beat again. What are you most excited about doing now? So first of all, I will say that I am most excited about having this summer off. The last time I had three weeks in a row off, Mahesh, it was 1980. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm looking, I, I just moved into a new house about 18 months ago, so I haven't done a thing to this house. I'm looking forward to bringing this house in, in, into shape as well. And I also told my daughter-in-law that this summer she has a day a week off because I'm going to go down and take my granddaughters once a week for a vacation, for a, an adventure. So that's my big thing this summer. And clearly you're, you're getting a kayak soon too. Yeah, so I'm picking it up tomorrow, and so I'll be kayaking around Gloucester. So that's that's a big deal. Well, Serge, I think of many of the people that I've worked for, worked with over the past 15 years or so. You're certainly one of my favorites. Kind of on my on a personal level, you kind of have been part of. I think a lot of. You were there for my second company. You were there when I got married. You were there when I had my first house. Yeah. So, hey, thank you. I'm actually a little bit emotional talking about it, but. Uh. Mahesh, I, I want to thank you because I like to say that Mahesh is the smartest person I've ever met. You're always open to ideas. Like even when I come up with some stupid things, you'll <laughs> listen and tell me, hey, but this is the other way to look at it. And I mean, that's the brilliant part about you. And working with you has been amazing. And uh, thanks for all of that. Thanks for bringing this great technology forward. Thanks for being the best advocate for it. And thanks for helping motivate the teams. I think it's huge. So thank you, Mahesh. Thank you, man. This was a really good conversation. I, yeah, really I enjoyed was. it. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Mic Drop. We would love to hear your thoughts on our podcast and your ideas for future episodes. Send us a note at micdrop at motorolasolutions.com. We promise to maybe read all your emails. And with that, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs>